The spring and summer of 2020, bike shops struggled to meet the surging demand from new cyclists. Since then, retailers have been able to get their inventories in shape. With more bikes, motorcycles, mopeds, and scooters on the road, transportation experts say the moment is prime for transit upheaval. All of this combined is called micro-mobility. Here's how having more bikes on the road could change the U.S. transportation system. There are two groups of people who have picked up biking during the pandemic. Those who use it to commute to work or get around, and those who use it for fitness and recreational purposes. Shannon Un falls into the first bucket. She signed up for a city bike membership in New York City this September. Losing the bike for me right now is basically just getting myself from one place to another. I was not biking before the pandemic just because biking in New York City was it's so scary and cars were just all over the place and I just avoided bikes at all costs. But now the reason why I changed is because that um, there's lesser cars and I just feel much safer on a bike. Shannon also represents the growing number of women in the traditionally male-dominated activity. In New York, women are now the biggest users of the city's bike share program since it launched in 2013. Early on in the pandemic, basic level adult bicycles mm. under $200 led bike sales, soaring more than 203% from the year prior. Sales of mountain bikes increased by more than 150%, and children bikes grew by 107%. Then, in June 2020, the demand shifted to higher-end bicycles worth more than $1,000, like road, mountain, and electric bikes. Before the pandemic, high-end electric bike company Van Moof tripled its production in anticipation of growth, but that wasn't enough. COVID changed a lot for us as a, as a company. It caused a lot of more uh, demand. Demand is much higher than, uh, than production at the moment. To give you an idea, I think we in Q2 2020, we had six times more demands than in uh, 2019. The biking infrastructure in the United States lags behind European nations and other countries where cycling is already integrated into their transportation systems. And for one big reason, in the U.S., cars are king. It's still the most common transportation mode, and actually this is also very much an impact of federal funding and federal policies. Up to 1991, almost all federal funding was going uh, towards the building of highways, towards, you know, uh, the car and a bit of public transit. It's the first time in 1991 that we see some dollars that is allocated to active means of transportation, improvements for cycling and, and biking. Since then, we have witnessed uh, more funding, uh, which has some impact in terms of, you know, building an infrastructure that is safer for, for cyclists. Some cities already had the funding and plans in place to launch an expansion of their biking network ahead of the pandemic. They were able to act quickly when they saw a rise in cycling interest. Seattle was one of those cities. It also was one of the first municipalities to announce it was making 20 of its 25 miles Stay Healthy Streets program permanent, a program meant to allow residents outside while maintaining a social distance. Seattle isn't alone. Around the world, cities like Bogota and Berlin also expanded their biking infrastructure. Others like Milan, London, and Geneva have added flexible bike lanes to separate bikers and cars. Even though more Americans are biking during the pandemic, it's not clear biking will maintain the popularity once it's over. When the U.S. reopened from COVID lockdowns during the summer months, transportation planners carefully watched a metric known as the vehicle miles traveled. It measures the amount of travel for all vehicles in an area over a period of time. That metric fell in March 2020. The number increased up, when baby? cities reopened from COVID lockdowns, indicating that people were taking longer hey. rides in their cars and a possible return to the congested roads. Yeah. Car traffic levels have not returned completely to no. pre-pandemic levels. What's for cities that have already prioritized shared micromobility and pedestrian pathways, biking will continue to grow as a permanent transportation option. Where are we going? 
2020 was truly a year like no other, especially in politics. It kicked off with only the third impeachment trial of a sitting U.S. president. Then there was the chaos of the Iowa caucus, and this fall, a record-breaking and contested presidential election. Here's NBC News senior national correspondent Chris Jansing with a look back at this unprecedented year. The year in politics no one saw coming. Have a great year. It all started out so normal. It simply isn't our time. Today I'm suspending my campaign for president. A huge Democratic field narrowing with a diversion from the trail to the trial of an impeached president. The president acquitted of abusing power and obstructing Congress. Not purposely, but I've done things wrong. But this is what the end result is. February is all about results, kicking off with a caucus. On the Iowa caucus. Iowa's. The snowy Saturdays, endless selfies, all very familiar, and route to an unfamiliar finish. Zero percent after 10 o'clock on the East Coast. Absolute chaos and confusion in the state of Iowa as technical issues overshadowed okay. the first votes of the presidential election. The losers were clear. I am not going to sugarcoat it. We took a gut punch in Iowa. The winners, not so much. I have a good feeling we're going to be doing very, very well here in Iowa. We are going on to New Hampshire victorious. Still, the campaign trudged on. Yeah, no offense, Iowa, but it's been kind of cool tonight to see who people voted for. <laughs> Thank you, New Hampshire. Joe Biden's campaign looking all but done. The former vice president, the guy who led the national polls for all of 2019 in tw into 2020, fifth place, 8%. While even more candidates actually are done. But then Jim Clyburn changed everything. South Carolinians should have for him with Joe Biden. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. South Carolina! Biden rolls and the competition gets rolled over. Just one dominant win after another. Just a month ago, he was all but gone in the race. Mike Bloomberg out after spending $1 billion for one win. There is your projected winner well, hey. in American Samoa. And in the midst of it all, the incumbent betting his campaign on minimizing a pandemic. When you have 15 people, and the 15 within a couple of days is going to be down to close to zero. But soon, rallies are canceled, primaries delayed, and the states become the new battleground. Non-essential people uh, should stay at home. We will get past this. We will get through this. I think there's a lot of fear uh, out there. Debates over masks, restaurants, schools, as the virus reshapes American life and the campaign. Supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful uh. light, and then I see the disinfectant, where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute, and is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? By April, Bernie Sanders is out, and in May, a horrific death that becomes an international rallying cry and again shakes up the race for president. Violence against peaceful protesters clears a path for a presidential photo op. Believe it or not. And calls for justice continue into July when the civil rights movement loses an icon. By John, we've got to keep getting into that good trouble. Another Capitol Hill farewell for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And with coronavirus deaths rising.